Good afternoon. Could I ask those members of the public who are in the gallery and making their way out, please do so uh, quickly and quietly, because we're about to go into uh, session. So I thank you in advance uh, for your cooperation. Thank you. Okay, the next item of business is a member's business debate on uh, motion 9401 in the name of John Swinney on celebrating the 100th anniversary of Catherine Stuart Murray, Duchess of Athol's election to the UK Parliament. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would invite those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on John Swinney to open the debate. Mr Swinney. Officer, I'm grateful to members who have signed this motion to commemorate the centenary yesterday of the election to the House of Commons of Catherine Murray, the Duchess of Athol, as the MP for Kinross and West Perthshire, and the first woman to be elected to the Commons from a Scottish constituency. It is not unreasonable for members of Parliament to wonder why on earth a lifelong Scottish nationalist has put down a motion and is leading a, debate, a members' debate in the Scottish Parliament to mark the centenary of the election of a Conservative and Unionist to the House of Commons, and I feel Parliament requires a bit of an explanation. Firstly, I do so because I believe it is vital in our politics that we look at people for who they are and what they do, rather than simply judging them from their party affiliation. I have always believed that, and I believe it ever more in today's rather toxic political climate. Secondly, Catherine Murray led an extraordinary and in many ways enigmatic political life that merits greater understanding and appreciation, because she did not act as we might all at first sight have expected a Conservative MP, who was also the Duchess of Athol, to act. And thirdly, as one of our parliamentary successors in the House of Commons and here in the Scottish Parliament, I think it is a bit incumbent on me to make sure this parliamentary acknowledgement takes place. No political life is straightforward or without question or challenge. I am sure there will be parts of the political life of Catherine Murray with which we will not all agree. But I believe this centenary marks an opportunity to ensure there is a greater awareness of a fascinating individual who made a contribution to our politics and whose work raises important questions of real validity for us today. The very election of Catherine Murray in the 1923 Westminster general election was remarkable in at least two respects. Firstly, just a decade earlier, she had been a vehement opponent of the right of women to vote. Yet, ten years later, her mind had been changed and she was elected to Westminster. Secondly, the election was a bit of a local cliffhanger. She won the seat from the Liberals with a majority of just 150 in a two-horse race. One of our current Conservative colleagues, Liz Smith, was herself involved in a cliffhanger election in a Perthshire seat back at the 2001 Westminster election. Mercifully, the majority of 48 on that occasion was in favour of my party and not her party, <laughs> and the deputy presiding officer may have had a, more than a passing interest in the outcome. Catherine Murray was one of only eight female MPs elected out of 615 to the House of Commons in 1923 and went on to make a significant contribution to business at Westminster. She took a close interest in how people were treated in the, in the then British Empire and was shouted down by male MPs for sharing with the House of Commons the horrific detail of female genital mutilation all those years ago. She believed if women in India were living under the umbrella of the British Empire, they should be protected from practices that were not approved of by the British Government. Her talent and her industriousness were recognised, and she went on to become the first female Conservative Minister as an Education Minister. She championed the power of education to safeguard the future of children, and the well-being of children became a central feature of her political contribution. When the Conservatives went into opposition, she went to the back benches, and her political outlook began to take a new course. She took a keen interest in matters of international policy, and became increasingly alarmed by the rise of fascism in Europe. There were strands of the British establishment in the 1930s who were entirely relaxed by this growing spectre in Europe and did not believe the United Kingdom needed to address this threat. Catherine Murray railed against this sentiment, which she saw as a direct threat to democracy and to human rights. She travelled extensively in Europe, 
to understand the events that were taking place and to try to, and to, try to comprehend the fear and the alarm that was spreading in a growing number of countries as the threat from fascism materialised. She warned of the dangers, but was increasingly marginalised and dismissed in the domestic debate. As the Spanish Civil War took its ferocious course, she was horrified by what she witnessed. She was especially alarmed by the dangers faced by children and the effects of the warfare on them. She worked at speed with others to arrange for 4,000 children to be brought to the safety of the United Kingdom and to avoid the horror of the Spanish Civil War. Her actions were necessary in the 1930s, but they contain important lessons for us today. Uh, of course I will. Tom Cameron. Um, can I thank John Swinney for bringing this debate to the Parliament and also for hosting the event last night, which I attended, um, where there was um, a huge array of different perspectives brought, brought upon the life of um, Catherine Murray. She was, of course, a Scottish Unionist although, and had a very difficult relationship with the Conservative Party as time went on and represented, I think, a very important theme in my party's tradition of the patriotic liberal unionism that was shared by people like Walter Elliott and John Buchan. But in terms of the well-being of children, um, he will have heard last night the fascinating um, evidence of um, one of his um, speakers about the experience of of coming over from Spain. And I just wondered if he had any further observations on that. John Swinney. Well, President Officer, Donald Cameron's timely intervention brings me to the event last night that, um, that I hosted in Parliament, where we welcomed to the Scottish Parliament some of the children of the children who were brought out of the turmoil of the Spanish Civil War to the safety of the United Kingdom by the Duchess of Athol. They told the stories of their parents' survival and wanted to say one thing to the family of the Duchess of Athol who were present last night. They wanted to express their thanks for the actions of the Duchess of Athol, because quite simply without them, those children would not be here today. And those lessons are vital for us as we wrestle with these challenges in our society at this moment. The Duchess of Athol's acute interest in the rise of fascism led her to closely study the contents of Hitler's words in Mein Kampf. She read the original text in German, she was a German speaker, and felt that the English translation that was originally on offer did not properly convey the contents of Hitler's full plan. She therefore arranged for a full English translation and agitated to get the United Kingdom government of the time to take seriously the threat that was emerging. She became increasingly frustrated that she could not convince the British government to act so she tried to force their hand. She triggered a by-election in Kinross and West Persia on the 21st of December 1938, a very cold winter's night apparently, to try to address the issue. The huge might of the Conservative Party was deployed against her and she lost the by-election, but only very narrowly. She may have lost the by-election, but events would prove that her concerns were valid and legitimate. I suspect few people would know if they were asked in the street who was the first female MP elected in Scotland. I think it would be a surprise for them to find that individual was married to an aristocrat, opposed suffrage for women, a Conservative unionist who campaigned for educational opportunities for all, helped refugee children to safety from the Spanish Civil War, and ended her political career to press the alarm about the rise of fascism. That, however, is the enigmatic life of the Duchess of Athol, the MP for Conross and West Persia, Catherine Murray, the Red Duchess. Thank you, Mr Swinney. I now call Keith Brown to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Mr Brown. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And uh, can I also congratulate John Swinney on bringing this really interesting debate uh, to the Parliament and also offer my apologies for being unable to attend the event last night. And like John Swinney, I think you do question yourself when you have a debate such as this and the subject matter, um, as John Swinney said, in relation to being an SNP member talking about a duchess. And I think in relation to uh, this debate, uh, as Robert Browning said, this will be my last duchess, um, I think, of debate in the Parliament. 
but it's a very worthwhile uh, subject for debate. My connection is a bit more personal, and I won't, I'll try not to repeat some of the points which John Swinney speaks about from a, a position of far greater authority. Uh, after the 2011 election, we went, myself and the current Minister for Culture, to Pitlochry for a break after the election, and during that time, uh, visited uh, Blair Athol and found out about uh, the Red Duchess and were blown away just by the history and, I have to say, completely unaware of the background uh, before that uh, point. And also, from my own point of view, my grandfather from Pitlochry, he um, gave my father the name Athol, as I've given to my son and my brother also had, although it's a, a second uh, name. So there's a, that, that family connection with uh, Blair Athol itself. Um, and I learned, as I say, during that visit to Pitlochry in 2011 about the importance of the immense historical figure that is uh, Catherine Stuart Murray and her contribution to Scottish life. Uh, and I think it is important that we pay reference to that, even if it's just on the issue of the fact it's the first woman to be elected um, to the House of Commons from Scotland. Um, it was in itself an immense achievement when we consider that the franchise had only been expanded to include some women just five years prior and would not be expanded to all women for another five years subsequent to the Duchess's election. Uh, during her time in the Parliament, she embarked on a trailblazing political journey marked by a distinctively feminist outlook, although it might be a, a feminism of a different brand to uh, that which some feminists today would recognise but all the more difficult for that reason. Um, her feminism did not stop at Gretna or Dover, as we've heard. It also explicitly uh, was international during the Spanish Civil War, which is an event intimately tied to Scotland's own history. Uh, Catherine Stuart Murray saw the impact of the conflict, especially on women and girls, and made this the focus of her book, Searchlight on Spain, which was instrumental in persuading the British government to accept the child refugees which had been mentioned from the Spanish Civil War. In other words, she sits within that tradition of strong women who broke the status quo of Scottish politics. And there are many that we can look to, both her contemporaries, uh, one such being Lavinia Malcolm, who was the first woman councillor and first woman Lord Provost in Scotland, uh, within my own constituency, in fact, within the village Dollar, in which I live. Uh, I lodged a motion on that uh, uh, on my election in 2007. And also Florence Marion McNeill, a leading Scottish suffragist, one of the leading lights of the Scottish literary renaissance of the 20th century, and also a founding member of the SNP. We've also heard, we all know of Elsie Ingalls, the well-known doctor, surgeon, teacher, and Scottish suffragist, Mary Barber, the Glasgow councillor who famously organised the rent strikes, and those who came after Catherine Stuart Murray's time, like, of course, Winnie Ewing or Margaret MacDonald, both of whom won stunning by-election victories against very significant odds and also champion difficult causes in need of a champion for the rest of their lives, much as uh, Catherine Stuart Murray did. Uh, and of course, our first female First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, among many, many more, far too many, many to mention in this short speech. Uh, Catherine Stuart Murray sits firmly within that tradition of strong Scottish women of independent mind, who against all odds achieved, I know that's a phrase that we use just now, but if you think about the realities of electoral politics even 100 years ago, how difficult it was to break the mould, either as a woman or, or uh, as an independent, which she, um, uh, may have been seen to have been subsequently. But no instance shows that um, resilience more than her stance against authoritarian regimes, especially her opposition to Franco Spain, to Mussolini's Italy, the Soviet Union, uh, and lastly, Hitler and Nazi Germany, which ultimately, as we've heard, led to her deselection uh, from what was then the Scottish Unionist Party, as it was out of step with the then Prime Minister Chamber Chamberlain's policy of appeasement. Hitler, of course, um, uh, uh, appeasing Hitler, of course, is now widely regarded to have been a strategic mistake in the build-up to the Second World War, and even that's understating it to a large extent. But it is a timely reminder that even when something at the time may not be popular, it may also be the right thing to do. So today, the Parliament and our government is amongst the most representative in the world for women. I'm very pleased that my party now has more female MSPs than male MSPs, and that's contributed to a more balanced uh, Scottish Parliament. Um, but we have among the most representatives in the world for women. Let's see if today's debate is an opportunity to celebrate how far we have come in the 100 years since Catherine Stuart Murray's election as our first woman MP, but also much, how much further we have to go. And to also use today to reaffirm our commitment to continue to work towards true gender equality, not just nationally or at UK level, but internationally as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Brown. And I now call Murdo Fraser, who is joining us remotely, to be followed by Richard Leonard. Mr Fraser. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I start by congratulating uh, John Swinney on securing this debate today and uh, thank him for his overview of the life of uh, the Duchess of Athol. And I'm sorry I'm not able to be there in person uh, in the chamber today, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to join the event last night, for which we have to blame uh, black ice on uh, the Edinburgh pavements. Um, but we should also recognise uh, the efforts of Jane Anderson, the former archivist at Blair Castle, uh, and Paul Ramsey of uh, in keeping her memory alive. And also, of course, Elizabeth Quigley, uh, who has presented a very good BBC report on the Duchess's life. This is an important date to mark, both in the context of Perthshire and Scottish politics as a whole. Today, we are commemorating the life of a true pioneer in Scottish politics the first female MP in Scotland. Elected to the Kinross and West Perthshire seat in 1923 as a member of the Unionist Party, Catherine stewart Murray retained her seat until the 1938 general election. And she was, as we've already heard, a complex and controversial character in her own time. She was a rare independent thinker at a period when the existing order of the international system was both turbulent and volatile, and her views were often out of step with the consensus of the day, not least in her own party. Catherine Marjorie Ramsay was born in 1874 and married John Stuart uh, Murray, uh, who was the uh, Marquis of Tullibardine, later the 8th Duke of Athol, in 1899. He was at that point the Unionist MP for West Perthshire, but had to surrender his seat in 1917 on inheriting the dukedom. At that point, the seat was won by the Liberals, but uh, uh, Catherine herself won the seat in 1923, well, to serve in government as parliamentary secretary to the Board of Education, and was the first woman, other than the mistress of the robes, to serve in a British Conservative government as a minister. Now, as John Swinney reminded us, the Duchess had been a vigorous opponent of female suffrage, in fact, one of the leading campaigners against female suffrage in Scotland. But that did not stop her standing for Parliament when the opportunity arose. And that position was, was one of a number of controversial positions that she would hold. And famously, she would align herself to a number of causes that did, did not endear itself to the Conservative leadership of the time. She was an active supporter of the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War, which earned her the nickname the Red Duchess. She was closely involved in humanitarian efforts, becoming chairwoman of the National Joint Committee for Spanish Relief, and in that capacity was successful in persuading the British government to admit child refugees from Spain. The Duchess was very concerned about the rise of fascism in Italy and Germany. Her willingness to go against the prevailing view adopted by the appeasement wing of her party in relation to the uh, recognising the threat posed by Nazi Germany is one that proved not only commendable, but also right. And it was this decision to side with the likes of Winston Churchill and Anthony Eden that would later cost her her seat in the House of Commons. She faced a deselection process orchestrated from the top of her party and subsequently stood as an independent candidate. She faced an exceptionally nasty campaign in which her former party threw everything at to try and ensure she was defeated. Despite numerous accounts of irregularities, including threatening behaviour within the constituency, she was only narrowly defeated by 5.8 percentage points. And had the election been held just a few weeks later, some have argued it would very likely have resulted in the opposite outcome had the confirmation of Hitler's intent in Europe been projected to the world earlier. What she had long argued for then became indisputable. The Nazi Germany presented an existential threat to Britain, to stability in Europe and the existing world order. Like Churchill, she was proven right. So as Scotland's first female MP, she was certainly a trailblazer. The Duchess was not someone loved by party managers. She was someone who knew her own mind and was prepared to be outspoken for the causes she believed in. We could perhaps do with a few more cast in her mould today. So she was a woman with a remarkable story. It is right that we should remember the anniversary of her first election and join together to pay tribute to her legacy. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Fraser. I now call uh, Richard Leonard to be followed by Jim Fairley. Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank John Swinney for bringing this motion on Catherine Stewart Murray before us? Uh, and I do not think it would be breaching her confidence if I recall a conversation I had with John Swinney just after he stepped down as Deputy First Minister. I'll spend all my time on the back benches, he told me, attacking the Tories. And yet here we are in only his second members' debate from the back benches, asking us to praise one of them. So um, I think uh, what he said earlier on is, um, is quite important. I also have to make a confession, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Duchess of Athol does not figure very prominently on my bookshelves. So my reading and my speech might be a little selective. Of course, the firebrand MP Jenny Lee was a contemporary, first elected to Parliament for North Lanark in 1929 at the age of 24, when there were still very few women uh, in the House of Commons. And Jenny Lee's biographer, Patricia Hollis, records that while Catherine Stewart Murray had actively opposed women's suffrage, uh, she, I quote Patricia Hollis, found herself radicalised by her time in the House. Uh, Tom Johnson also recalls the Duchess in a footnote in his 1952 publication, Memories. But his rather more polemical, notorious, and so memorable book, Our Scots Noble Families, nearly half a century earlier, uh, made a rather uh, different point. He said, the history of the Stuart Murrays reads like an Arabian romance of successful crime. His chapter on the family begins with the Edward Carpenter couplet, a robber band has seized the land and we are exiles here. The most virulent critic, Johnson goes on to declare, of our hereditary rent drawers and land grabbers could never honestly deny that the Athol family motto of Firth Fortune and Fill the Fetters had been scrupulously acted up to. The only unfortunate thing being, said Tom Johnson, was that it all, was always other people who filled the fetters. On a brighter note, the Duchess also appears as a footnote in Hugh Thomas's seminal work on the Spanish Civil War. Hugh Thomas concludes that the Red Duchess's uh, Searchlight on Spain, published in 1938, selling over 100,000 copies, was the most successful of all the propaganda books on the Spanish War. She chaired the National Joint Committee for Spanish Relief, and it was in that role, helping to rescue 4,000 refugee children from the Basque Country, that the Duchess made a real, a practical, a humanitarian difference. I agree with respected writers like Daniel Gray that, in truth, I do not think the ennobled, upper-class, blue-blooded Catherine Stewart Murray was red at all, but she certainly distinguished herself as a member of parliament who was anti-Franco, anti-fascist and anti-appeasement, a stance which made her unpopular among the British political establishment in the 1930s. Patricia Hollis also describes how, in her words, the culture of the commons was, of course, exaggeratedly masculine, rowdy, boozy, assertive and quarrelsome. It is a culture still too prevalent in politics today. Into this, the first woman MP elected in Scotland had to fight to be heard, but in so doing, she became the first woman ever to hold office in a Conservative government. She resigned the Conservative whip in 1935, in part over its position on constitutional reform in India. And when she fell out with her party for the last time in 1938, over, let's remember, the Munich Agreement, she possessed the political principles to resign her seat and fight a by-election were only those same principles applied today. So I want to thank John Swinney for tabling this motion. And in conclusion, I hope that in return, he and other MSPs will sign up to motions that I've submitted in the last few days on last week's centenary of the death of the great Red Clydeside socialist John McLean on the 25th anniversary of the passing of the heroic miners' leader and political visionary Mick McGarhy.
because it is important that this parliament marks the lives of those noble leaders of the working class and it is right that we find a place in this parliament for history which is made not just by those from selected stock but history which is made by the masses. Thank you Mr Leonard. And I now call Jim Fairley to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Mr Fairley. Thank you, President Officer. It is my great pleasure to take part in today's debate, and I heartily congratulate John Swinney for not only bringing the debate to the Chamber, but also for the fabulous event which I attended last night, which was already been referenced. And hearing from, his, uh, from her great-nephew, Paul Ramsey, and the children of the youngsters she brought over here truly was a mesmerising experience. More importantly, though, I must thank him for bringing the said lady to my attention. For, like many, I have to say to my great shame, I had no idea who she was, despite her relevance to my constituency of Persia, South and Russia, but more importantly of all, what she accomplished in a quite remarkable lifetime. As John has already said, the fact that she became a Member of Parliament is all the more remarkable that her initial stance was against women's suffrage. And even after an election, she voted against lowering the age of women's right to vote. So to say she's complex is a bit of an understatement. There's also the dichotomy of her privilege and her upbringing and the causes that she chose to pursue. But for me, that demonstrated her humanity rather than her heritage. None of us choose the family or the lifestyle we are born into. And the important thing when we are in that life is what we do with it and how we shape our circumstances. We as a nation laud great men of entrepreneurial spirit who have helped shape our country, especially the self-made ones. And yet I didn't even know who she was. So that's a societal problem we still have to challenge ourselves with to this day. Kitty Murray may well have been born into privilege, but she used that privilege to great effect in helping others, as other colleagues have stated, despite the fact that she got herself into considerable problems in the process. She lost the election that she forced, but she had the considerable public support. There's a book by a gentleman called Mike Levi, the Red Duchess, Catherine Duchess of Athol, and he quotes her in a response to the local Conservative and Unionist CA <coughs> leader asking her to tone down her support for the Spanish revolutionaries. And she said, I am sorry to hear of objections from constituents about my visit to Spain, but I hope these will gradually lessen. I think public opinion down here is turning a good deal since the destruction of Garnicia, and I hope that my letters to the newspapers will help to enlighten opinion a little. This fracture with her local party would become unbridgeable the following year. She clearly did have support, however, because during the election campaign that she'd forced and was fighting, this was written in the Scotsman, I think it was by John Dick of Glasgow. <clears throat> Defy the fascist hordes with challenge strong and clear. Though loud their drums and bright their swords, they're sick at heart with fear. Scorn Hitler's blatant nose and Mussolini's fray. And when they hear a manly voice, the cads will slink away. They listen on the air in Berlin, London, Rome. Then tell the rogues that these mountains bare are still the free man's home. The world is on the rack, O oh, Scottish hearts be true, and send the noble lady back, or endless shame on you. And history has shown that she was absolutely correct. There is another book that has currently been written by the author Amy Gray, which is due to be published in 2025 for Zion Officer. I don't normally look forward that length of time for the release of a book, but this is one that I will definitely be pre-ordering to learn even more about the remarkable Kitty Murray, the Duchess of Athol. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Feely, and I now call Stephen Kerr. Ms. I'd like to begin by uh, congratulating John Swinney, not only on the, uh, bringing the motion to the Chamber for debate, but also on his speech, which I could agree with. Um, and I thought it was very interesting to hear Richard Leonard make that revelation known to the Chamber that what motivates John Swinney today is to be on the back benches to attack the Tories. So that does make this motion even more remarkable. Um, so I pay tribute to him for organising the event last night and also wish to give belated apologies for my absence. Catherine Stuart Murray, the Duchess of Athol, stands as a figure of rare courage and principle. Her legacy is etched not only in her groundbreaking political milestones, which have been referenced in the speeches we've heard, but in the unwaver unwavering stance she took against the tide of popular opinion within her own party. And I think that Donald, Stewart, uh, Donald Cameron was quite right when he identified the tension, the fundamental tension that sometimes did exist between Scottish Unionist members of Parliament and the Conservative Party. 
But it's her commitment to her convictions at such a steep price, her seat in Parliament, uh, that uh, I think draws my admiration. And, and, and that actually outstrips the constraints of time. In 1923, she engraved her name in history, becoming, as we've heard, Scotland's first female member of Parliament. She didn't rely on the quotas or all women shortlists. It was on the basis of sheer force of personality, her dedication, hard work and prowess, a testament to her talent. The 1930s were difficult times for the world and Scotland. We've heard all about that. There was support for totalitarianism around the world, and it was manifest in the United Kingdom. Perhaps we should approach the subject of viewing that period of history from the point of view that the people involved at that time may, would not have known, may not have known, the full extent of the horrors that were to be unleashed on the world by the forces of fascism and communism. And yet we must learn from those mistakes. It's absolutely right to say, as a couple of speakers have said, that the British establishment had somewhat nuanced views towards uh, fascism and Nazism. The SNP itself has an interesting, colourful period of its history where leading figures within its ranks were known to have sympathies for fascism and indeed for Hitler. But Catherine Stuart Murray saw through the forces of totalitarianism. She knew by instinct and by principle that she was against them. And she was a vocal cri critic of regimes like Stalin's Soviet Union, abhorring the very notion of a state dictating the private lives of its citizens. Her belief in individual freedoms and the right to self-determination was unwavering and manifested itself in vocal condemnation, for example, of the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. In, as has been mentioned, in 1937, she went to Spain with other parliamentarians from the House of Commons. She then registered her open dissent against the non-intervention policies of the then British government in the Spanish Civil War, and that led her to chair the National Joint Committee for Spanish Relief. In her book, referenced earlier by Richard Leonard, Searchlight on Spain, a bestseller, was also a bold critique of the conflict, and it flew in the face of the Conservative Party's then prevailing sentiments and drew considerable opposition from the leadership of the party. That's what led eventually to, sadly, her demise politically. Uh, she was no stranger to conflict with the Conservative Party. Her resignations over the India Bill, her opposition to the uh, government's domestic policies in 1935, uh, 1938, her opposition to the policy of appeasement against Nazi Germany, all these highlight her unyielding commitment to her beliefs. Her unwavering stance against prevailing party lines led, as, as has been mentioned, to her eventual ousting. She resigned, there was an orchestrated campaign against her before she resigned, and then there was an orchestrated campaign to unseat her when she stood as an independent in the by-election that's been referenced. But her political life, in conclusion, speaks volumes. Her message transcends historical context. The truth is, in our parliament, in many a parliament, the weight of party machines and whips at times stifles authentic debate. And as we commemorate a century since the election of Catherine Stuart Murray, Duchess of Athol, I think the, ling the, the singular lesson, certainly that I take to heart, is there is an imperative that we as individual parliamentarians stand firm for what we believe in and have as a right as individuals to believe in, even if it means diverging from the prevailing consensus within this chamber, within popular opinion, within establishments, and even within our parties. Thank you, Mr Kerr. And I now call on Minister Emma Roddick to respond to the debate. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I just want to start by saying I am really grateful to John Swinney for bringing this motion today and giving us the opportunity to mark the centenary of Catherine Stuart Murray's election. As we've heard, an unusual character. I doubt that she and I have a great deal in common, but I did feel a connection with her journey from campaigning against women's suffrage to then standing for election herself. I've never been opposed to women having the vote, but um, back in 2014, I did argue against the vote being given to me and to other 16 and 17 year olds in the independence referendum. I genuinely and strongly believed that I should not be given the vote. Now, going from that 
to becoming the youngest member of this parliament and government, and now a firm supporter of the right of 16 and 17 year olds to vote, I do think I understand that journey. And I think it shows the impact that enfranchising people can have and how the best of us can internalise misogyny and inequalities, including those of us who are victims of it. I'm sure that she was genuine in her opposition to women's suffrage in the beginning, but the context in which she lived, where it was accepted that women were not equal, and then the vote being extended, both clearly had an impact on her belief system and perhaps her, her view of herself as well. Now, I enjoyed the suggestion from Richard Leonard of uh, radicalisation by exposure to men in politics. I think that's something that a lot of women and now feminists in, in politics nowadays can, can sympathise with, which really leads me on to the other reason I welcome this motion. It gives us an opportunity to reflect more widely on how women's experiences and representation in politics has evolved in the last century. It's easy for us to see that things are certainly better after 100 years, but that's a considerable time frame and change has been very slow. We often hear from those who don't want to talk about or perhaps accept the problem of underrepresentation of any groups that it needs to be the best person for the job, as if that's who we can possibly get every time when there are inequalities baked into the system. If we are going to get the best person for the job, there needs to be equal footing for all genders, for disabled and able-bodied and neurotypical, for all ethnicities and sexual orientations. And while that does not exist, we are only likely to get the best white male for the job. In 2021, there was an historic high of 58 women elected as MSPs. That's 45% of the chamber. But it was not until 2021 that any women of colour were elected to Holyrood and that we had our first permanent wheelchair user. And we know now what the impact of women in government is. The Scottish Government has introduced a number of important policies which likely would not have been possible without strong representation of women in government. And these include free period products for all, 1140 hours of funded early learning and childcare for all eligible children, our ambitious women's health plan to reduce inequality in health outcomes for women and to improve information and services for women. And we've also got a number of initiatives to support more women into politics. And Gender's Equal Representation Project works with political parties to increase diverse representation of women. Uh, they've produced a toolkit to enable political parties to assess their diversity and policies around inclusion and receive an individualised action plan to improve the participation of underrepresented groups. Now, that project importantly brings together stakeholders working for representation of racialised minorities, disabled people and the LGBTQI plus community, recognising that intersectional representation is needed. Elect her support and equip women to stand for political office through hands-on workshop and peer support circles. 54 women were supported by Elect her in the 2022 Scottish Local Authority elections, with 27 winning. But to accurately understand the situation, it's very important we look at not just the number of women elected each time around, but how many stay on and are retained for a full or, or more than one term. We see this across politics, only 35% of Scottish councillors are women. We've just had FMQs out of five party leaders in here, only one is a woman, of course, a co-leader in a position that cannot be filled by a man. Now, that's not necessarily a problem in itself. We've got some excellent men in this parliament who do what they can for women's issues. And I note that John Swinney, Keith Brown, Richard Leonard and Jim Fairley are all wearing white ribbons today. And we have a male first minister committed to tackling all equalities with an understanding of intersectional issues. And everyone but me to speak in this debate today has been a man. But when a pattern begins to emerge of women citing similar reasons for stepping back from public life, when the impact of equalities mechanisms disappears, when the mechanisms do rather than having a long-term impact, that shows that there's a problem to solve. Point, Certainly. Stephen Kerr. Mr. Kerr, it could be well, Mr. Kerr's microphone, please. My fault. Um, I wasn't going to intervene. But I'm intervening because thus far the Minister hasn't really referenced the primary topic of the motion, which is the life of this remarkable lady, the Duchess of Athol. And I'm wondering whether she can draw some uh, inspiration from the fact that this lady, the first 
a Scotswoman to sit in the House of Commons representing a Scottish constituency. She did so showing great tenacity, great self-belief. She also showed great principle. Does, does she draw anything from that political life that could inform us in this chamber to make us all better parliamentarians? Minister. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's what I'm discussing here, because we do see a remarkable woman who fought and fought and fought, but she should not have had to. And the problem is that many women are still having to fight the party system, the parliament system, to contribute to public life, as she did. And we're seeing that women who are getting elected are finding barriers they didn't expect once they get here, whether it's misogyny and harassment or struggling to access childcare or health, such as menopause support away from home. And we see at the end of every session successful women citing family or caring responsibilities. And what they've discovered is the incompatibility of those and their role here as the reason that they're not seeking re-election. Now, the Parliament's gender-sensitive audit made more than 30 recommendations on how to improve the Parliament's rules, practices and culture. And I think it's important that we keep the progress going in here internally to improve the experience of women and other underrepresented groups. Because we know that the problem is wider and deeper and there remains a need for societal change. If we are listening today to stories of a woman 100 years ago in Parliament and being able to connect those to the lived experience of women who sit in this modern parliament today, then that shows us just how far we need to go. And we may be able to confidently say that our parties wouldn't act the same way towards women who dare to think for themselves as happened to Catherine Stewart Murray, but much of that attitude does remain and is still visible. We will not effectively make societal change without women who understand both the equalities at play and how it impacts them being part of this process. They are being removed from that process due to our own structures and attitudes. So I thank all the men in the room who are engaging with the likes of White Ribbon, who are listening to female colleagues, because all of these issues are connected. And I encourage everyone to take notice of the remaining inequalities at play and do whatever is in their power to tackle them. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate. And I suspend this meeting until 2.30pm. Thank you.